typically have children. Not always, but usually they're gonna get the priority over other low-income individuals to move into housing. Pruitt ICO was a St. Louis, Missouri public housing project. It was built with very little ventilation, very little windows, really long dark corridors, and so it just became an example of poor design that just did breed crime and drug use and drug dealings and all kinds of unintended consequences and doing so the government just realized it was a horrible design and we had to get rid of it and so we blew it up and sort of moved to different models. So some of the affordable housing or public housing or housing in which there's Section 8 looks like anything else, looks like any other market rate, condominiums or townhomes or row homes and that's part of it. If you can nestle in a design that it doesn't stand out as being something different, people aren't going to be as resistant to it if it looks just like any other apartment complex or any other condo development in an area. So I will show students some images of current public housing around the country and they'll look at it and think, oh, that doesn't look like public housing, that just looks like where I live. And that's the idea. So one of the issues that came out of the Reagan years was deinstitutionalization, that we had a lot of um, individuals that had mental health problems that we sort of locked up in mental institutions and the thought of you know, locking somebody up inhumanely when they hadn't done anything in terms of a crime um, and the costs that it incurred, we closed a lot of the mental institutions that we had around the country. And so many scholars argue that the rise in homelessness that occurred after the Reagan years of homeless mentally ill out, out on the street were largely these individuals. So they had been institutionalized, they had a place to stay, now we let them go, they have no skill, they have no ability to manage their own mental health status, and they're left on the street. It's considered a housing choice voucher with the idea of instead of, um, if somebody's on the wait list for public housing and their name comes up to the top of the list, oftentimes there's one or two avenues you can go. One is your name's up and there's a public housing unit for you in the southeast part of town, that's where you get to go because that's the only one that's available. And if you don't want it, your name gets back to the bottom of the list. Or you get a voucher, and what the voucher tells you is go find a landlord who's willing to accept this voucher. Find an apartment, more or less a market rate apartment. Um, and you'll sign your lease, and the client who has the voucher will pay a third of their income towards the rent, and the voucher from HUD will pay rest of it. So if I have a $1,000 a month income, and I find a housing unit for $1,000 a month to rent, I'll pay $300 to the landlord directly, and then my voucher will cover the other 700 from the government. So it's allowing people to be, in theory, in, in higher quality housing units. Um, from the landlord's perspective, there's really little risk because $700 you know you're gonna get every month coming from the government, and the 300 needs to come from the client. If the client doesn't pay it, then they lose their voucher. <laughs> Housing advocates are concerned that we're stripping even more of an already bare system that's out there. We've stripped budgets back from most of our health and human services over the last two, three decades. Um, we keep having more and more clients in need and more and more clients applying for services and fewer and fewer dollars from which to serve. So the per capita dollar of serving clients is getting even smaller. Um, you know, even on the Democratic left, the budgets have been curtailed. Um, part of the argument is, you know, in American society, we're a capitalist society, and the notion is your successes are your successes and your failures are your failures. And so there is a notion of, there's different theories of poverty, um, why people are poor, and one of the arguments is that you're poor because you're lazy. <laughs> and so if you're lazy, we're not going to give you a handout. And you need to work, just like everybody else, and pay your fair share. Um, one of the theories of poverty is that there's discrimination, that African Americans or Hispanics or other marginalized populations don't get the same opportunities, um, and that if they're starting off um, from the level playing field where I have a family that has no resources versus somebody whose parents are physicians and has lots of money that live in a better area that have better primary 
education through high school and have the ability to go to better colleges, they're already starting off at a higher point. And so the person that's starting with a minimum wage job parent who has no um, education maybe past elementary school or high school is gonna have a harder time, period. Um, they may not be able to help their child navigate the academic network. By the time that child gets to a higher age, um, older age, they don't have the resources to go to college. So all they can have is a minimum wage job. And so that kind of concentration of poverty just continues. And so the, the often the, the theory on the right is that you're poor because you just didn't try hard enough. And sociologists look at it as a structural problem, that you're born into a neighborhood in which there's limited opportunities, there's no jobs near where you live, um, you don't have money to get a car, and so you're limited to public transit, which may in most parts of the country be pretty horrific. In San Francisco we have a great transit system, up in Sonoma, Napa we don't. And for most people, the federal government looks at affordable housing being housing that you don't spend more than a third of your income. Um, most of California, we spend half of our money on income, or half of our income on our, our housing. Uh, we spend another 17 to 25 percent of our income on transportation. So if you're spending 75 percent of your income for housing and transportation to have a car and to have a place to live, that leaves very little left for anything else. Disposable income, college savings, retirement savings. And so what we often find are low-income families don't have much. They just don't have enough to save. So they don't have enough to save for college. They don't have enough to save for later. So now I'm a person who's grown up low income in an inferior school and I want to go